friend, it's been a while since I've done more of a casual video, so I have a lot to do in terms of my bees today, so I figured I'd take you along for more of a casual video, um, kind of like a behind the scenes of what my day is like today. So I just got done finishing uploading a video to YouTube and doing all the SEO and all that stuff. Oh my gosh, did you know all the captions that you see on those YouTube videos, that creator has to type out all of them themselves. Yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> but first thing on the list today is I need to wax all of these frames because I did not wax them correctly the first time and some of the frames that I got pre-waxed, um, I don't like the way they waxed them. And I tried a couple of them out in my hives and the bees do not like the way they're waxed either. So I get to redo them. And here is my dog, Harley. Meet Harley. Got the wax going, all the frames out, box to put them in. Yep, this is gonna take a couple hours. <laughs> here are the rollers that I use. Um, they're just plain old foam rollers. I think they're four inches. I found that these seem to work the best for waxing frames. Just as a general reminder, if you have any built out comb that you kept in like your garage for storage or something, please make sure you look over those frames really well. In fact, please freeze them because there is likely going to be wax moths on them. Um, I'm looking through some of my frames right now. And yeah, you see that down there? It's a squished uh, wax moth that <laughs> I just squished and it did have larvae in some of these cells. I just took this out of the freezer, so it should be good now, but yeah, I'm still gonna remove any cells that I do see that I know there's larvae in. All right, all waxed up and ready to go. I'm gonna leave some of this old comb that was wonky out for the bees to eat and do whatever they want with. <laughs> now out to the bee yard to check on some nukes. But first, we need a snack because nothing is worse than being out with the bees when you're hungry and I eat a lot. <laughs> so actually, the nectar is really starting to flow here in Michigan. I've noticed um, my bees really aren't bringing in much at all right now. So I think it's time to pull the trigger on pulling some of my honey. Now, I only have three hives that I'm gonna be able to get any honey off of this year since all of my other ones are brand new. But at least I'm gonna get a little bit of honey this year. I will say the honey that I have had from my hives in the past, like it takes my breath away, literally. It tastes like applesauce. So we have a lot of apple trees and I've usually only ever extracted honey in the fall. So I was never sure if maybe the reason they tasted like apples was because of one, the nectar that they're getting from the flowers, or if maybe they were getting it from the apples themselves when they fall and they start to kind of like rot away, um, getting sugars from those. Not really sure. So if you guys know, let me know. But I guess now the question is, do I do my most aggressive hive first? or do I do it last? <laughs> Since I'm not gonna be digging into the brood box today, um, I'm gonna save that for a different day because I have some splits coming up very soon. Uh, they shouldn't be too bad. So yeah, maybe I'll do them first. Okay, the weather has been really nice this time, so they shouldn't be too pissy. <laughs> but we will see how this goes and hope I don't get stung. Ants under the lid, not something that I like to see. Okay, not yet. There's still a lot of honey that is close to being capped, but isn't quite capped yet. So I'm going to give it a little bit more time before I pull that honey. So on to the next one. Now would you look at that. Look at all of these hives. <laughs> 
So since I can't take honey off of that hive we just checked on, I might be going to worry about looking at the other two that I was going to think about taking honey off of because I like to do all my honey at once. I don't want to be dirty and cleaning up equ uh, equipment twice. So yeah, a little bit easier to do it that way. But yeah, so I just got all of these nukes two days ago. My shipment of boxes will be in on Wednesday. So in two days. And then it'll take me a couple days to get them all put together and painted. And then I should have these babies in here by Saturday, hopefully. So in the meantime, I need to make sure they have enough resources. Make sure I don't have to feed. Probably going to have to, to be honest. And start checking on all of these hives to see how quickly they're going through their sugar water. I already see that this one, I just put this out two days ago and it's already almost empty. So, yeah, they're sucking it down pretty quick. Life of a beekeeper is literally having a constant supply <laughs> uh, of sugar water in your car. <laughs> so I have been doing some research lately on treatment-free beekeeping, but hold on, before you get your panties all up in a twist, Good. hear me out. The African government banned mite treatments in order to let the bees evolve and adapt on their own. The first couple of years were tough, but after three years, only the strong genetics that developed mite resistance survived. And now today, African beekeepers are no longer affected by Varroa. I am very interested in developing a system of selecting my hives that show some level of resistance and start rearing queens for the rest of my colonies off of those. But the reason I am sharing this with you is I think if we all started moving towards a system where we do our best to only bring in VSH certified queens that over time we could eventually see a day where our western honeybee is no longer affected by Varroa. Bees turn over fairly quickly and some scientists believe that queens have a way of selecting drones with superior genetics and workers can learn from each other. In the 1950s, there is this bird that's called the blue tit in the UK that had learned how to pop off the cap of milk bottles that were being delivered and it would suck the cream off the top of the milk and it only started with one bird. But then it taught others until every blue tit in the UK was popping off the caps to locals milk. The bird was able to teach other birds. Now that makes me wonder if one worker bee figure, figures out how to control for mites on its own, it will teach others in the colony. I understand the pushback for backyard beekeepers and those whose livelihood depends on their bees to not venture into treatment free beekeeping. It is a risk and could cost a lot of money in having to buy bees every year, but if we could all become more conscious of who we are buying our queens from and prioritize bringing in VSH qualities from some of the breeders who have successfully found a genetic of bee that does not require treatment, we could really see a shift in our fight against mites. And you never know, maybe I'll end up being one of those breeders since I plan to start pushing for this in my apiary. Okay, so nuke number one that I just went through my queen is itty bitty, so small that she can't even lay her eggs straight. She's laying them on the sides of the cell. And I know what you're probably thinking, make sure that you actually have a queen and it's not laying workers. But I did see her and yeah, she's got a little itty bitty butt. <laughs> Labeling these so that I could take notes and I know exactly what hive I'm talking about later. I've learned I need to take notes because I can't remember all of these. <laughs> looking good. I did not go through them to try to find the queen in any of them. Um, I don't really want to dig into them considering they're in a nuke and they're kind of hard to take out all the frames without pinching anything and I'm just going to go through them when I transfer them into their permanent residence um, at the end of this week. But I did make sure that I saw some eggs and milk brood in each one of them and I did so that's good. The only problem one that I saw was that very first hive that I checked. Um, that queen is, uh, yeah, she needs to be replaced because she's way too small. She can't even lay her egg straight, so. And I know you're probably thinking, Em, why did you buy all those nukes? Why didn't you just split your hives? So there's a reason behind it. I was a little bit nervous starting, um, well, 
first off, my hives aren't as strong as I would like them to be right now. Um, if I was to split off of them, I don't really want to do any two frame splits just because I'm nervous that August is literally next month and that's when winter preparation starts. And I'd like my hives to be strong going into winter so they come out in the spring pretty good and healthy and ready to go. Yes, I'm aware that you can overwinter a a nuke if you want to, um, but the whole purpose of me starting to expand right now is that I want to come out good in the spring because I have big plans for my business next year. So that's why I bought the nukes. Um, yeah, a little pricey, but <laughs> this will hopefully be the last time that I have to bring in outside bees. Everything after that will be splits just from my own hives. So yeah. So thanks for following along on my little agenda today with the bees. And I am so happy that you are here. Thank you so much for watching my videos. Um, it means the world to me, guys. You have no idea. And yeah, I hope you guys are having a great beekeeping year. And I hope you guys end it well. So I'll see you guys in the next one.